I am very happy to have an opportunity to talk about this book a little bit because it was not easy to write. I think it has a, a number of different lessons in it that I hope are something that are absorbed because we can only learn from history. But the main thing about the book is resilience, that they're uh, the, the real bravery of people. This is the Miller Center Forum from the University of Virginia. I'm Doug Blackman. Our guest today is Madeleine Albright, the first woman to serve as U.S. Secretary of State from 1997 to 2001, who navigated American response to crises around the globe, notably civil strife in the former Yugoslavia and Central Africa, a friend and counselor to leaders around the world, now a Georgetown professor and a prolific and widely read author. She joins us today for a conversation about her latest work, Prague Winter, a personal story of remembrance and war, 1937 to 1948. This book is a resonant and deeply informed account of the diplomacy and state interactions of the most pivotal years of the 20th century, as Hitler's armies are preparing for war and then march on the world. At the same time, it is also a meditation on the most difficult choices which must be made by nations and all humans. And finally, and most poignant, it is a deeply personal memoir and search for answers about a young girl whose name was Madlinka Korbelova. Thank you for joining us, Secretary Albright. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you very, very much. And I admire the work of the Miller Center. I've been here several times to do oral history, and I thank you very much, Governor Belisles. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I am very happy to have an opportunity to talk about this book a little bit because it was not easy to write. And um, I think it has a, a number of different lessons in it that I hope uh, are something that are absorbed because we can only learn from history. Um, it was, it, it, is kind of in the way you describe it in three layers. The inner story is the story of my family. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat. He was part of that first generation of Czechoslovaks. It was a new country formed in 1918, thanks to Woodrow Wilson in the United States. Um, its constitution was modeled on the American constitution with a, a major difference. It actually had equal rights language in it in 1918. Um, and so the inner story is their story. My parents as diplomats um, living in England during the war. Then my father was made ambassador to Yugoslavia. And then when the communists took over, we came to the United States. He defected, and we asked for a political asylum. And um, so that story. The second layer actually is about the war itself. And, um, decisions that were made, the unintended consequences of decisions, how the war was carried out, and its long-term effect. But the third layer was the hardest to work on, which is how you make moral decisions. I think we feel that, in fact, um, they're black and white. They are not. And so I talk about some of the examples of trade-offs that were made that are, that are really questionable. And, um, but the main thing about the book is resilience, that they're uh, the, the real bravery of people. I do think there are lessons for today. Um, one of the things that one could say, I think many of us wouldn't at this point, is that we didn't know what was going on um, in Europe during the war, uh, how people were being sent to concentration camps. And, uh, everybody, people were saying never again. And all of a sudden, what we saw in Bosnia and Kosovo, I will never forget these pictures. I wasn't even, didn't have a public job at the time as a professor, watching um, how people were being put into train cars again, being sent to certain concentration camps, only for what they were, not anything that they had done. And we knew everything that was going on there. And so the Clinton administration felt that we needed to do something about it. So what is happening today? Uh, we know that terrible things are going on in Syria. Uh, we are trying to sort out what to do. And one of the things for me that is echoes is Neville Chamberlain, who was the British prime minister who made all these arrangements, represented, and I think this is the, a lesson I hadn't thought of until I really wrote the book, is the British and French were really, really tired after World War I. 
They had lost a lot of people, and they didn't ever want to go to war again. And Neville Chamberlain, their prime minister, thought that all they needed to do was to do, have peace. It didn't matter what. They had to have peace. And he said about Czechoslovakia, why should we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names? We now are very tired from Iraq and Afghanistan. And the question is, why should we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names? And so I think it's worth looking at history and thinking about <clears throat> what our options are today. Why don't we stay on that topic for a moment? Um, and I mean, go. F we have a new Secretary of State, uh, literally uh, uh, just in uh, in his very first hours and days. Um, what you wrote a book once, uh, uh, which was something of a prescription for uh, the new President Obama uh, in 2008. Uh, what is would be the prescription or the counsel that you would offer to the Secretary of State, particularly in light of uh, what you've just said? Uh, I would be more humble, I think. Um, um, I, I did write a book, um, and I wrote it to the president-elect at a time when I had no idea who it was going to be. I, I finally did give it to President Obama, and I inscribed it with uh, the inscription of, with the audacity to hope that this book might be useful to you. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I had in there several umbrella issues, as I called them. Um, and I think that they continue to be there because they're very hard to deal with. How to fight terrorism without creating more terrorists. How to deal with nuclear proliferation. How to deal with the growing gap between the rich and the poor. In absolute numbers, there are fewer poor people in the world, primarily because the Chinese have lifted the equivalent of the American population out of poverty. Uh, and then that whole set of issues that kind of are energy, environment, global pandemics. And then something that I care deeply about is restoring the good name of democracy. I didn't have the financial crisis in there, but that clearly is part of it. And then a series of hot spots. But I think that those five umbrella issues are still there and have to be dealt with because they are, in a, many ways, a threat to America, which is what the job of the Secretary of State is, is to defend and represent the United States within an international context. And then add to that are the following issues. I think the Middle East is as complicated as it possibly can be in terms of the war in Syria, uh, which is a civil war at this point, is not only slaughtering people in Syria, but also is uh, uh, causing, I think, uh, instability in Jordan, problems in Turkey, problems in Lebanon, and in the last 48 hours, issues with Israel. Um, and then across what is happening in Egypt, so the Middle East area. Um, also, I was asked by the students earlier about Pakistan, and I, I have an answer, which is that Pakistan has everything that gives you an international migraine. Uh, it, it has uh, nuclear weapons, poverty, terrorism, um, corruption, a weak government, and it's in a really bad location. And so there are a lot of issues there. Then there are issues about how, what our new relationship uh, with China is. I believe that our relationship with China um, is the single most important strategic relationship for the 21st century, so the new secretary is going to have to deal with that. Uh, and then uh, people killing each other now in Africa and not understanding fully what's going on in Latin America, so the, uh, especially in Venezuela. So I do think that the, the Secretary Kerry has an awful lot that he has to do. I'm prejudiced, but I was really impressed uh, with his uh, a confirmation hearing because he knows more about more subjects than most people in terms of having had his time as uh, um, on the Foreign Relations Committee and then as chairman. And I think he's also going to have to deal with something that um, you don't quite realize how much time it takes, but executive legislative relations. And as when he, in his hearing, kept saying, well, you guys will do this, you'll do that. We'll see how that works. So um, he does have a lot. My sense is what I, th I don't know the answer to this, but I think it will be interesting to see what he does on his first trip, because people signal things in that way. My predecessors had all gone to Europe on their first trip. I decided that we needed to um, pay attention to Asia also. So I went from Europe to Asia on my first trip. Secretary Clinton went to Asia. 
Um, and so she already signaled the rebalancing. And we'll see where Secretary Kerry goes, because it kind of provides that signal. What would your advice be? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think that part of the thing is that um, uh, he will have to, he's already, all I know is what I read in the papers, though he does live around the corner for me, um, is that he called a lot of leaders over the weekend. Um, and he did speak to Prime Minister Netanyahu, according to the newspapers. And so I think that, and he, and I believe that he is going to have to spend a lot of time on the Middle East. One of the things, you know, there's the whole discussion about the, well, the word pivot, I thought was a really bad uh, choice of words, but rebalancing to Asia. And, um, which I think was an important thing to do. The United States is both an Atlantic and a Pacific power. But when I was somewhere on that trip um, as a private individual, somebody said, so what are you going to do about West Asia? And I thought, well, what is West Asia? It's the Middle East. So um, <laughs> no matter how you talk about it, there's going to be an awful lot of time that has to be spent in the Middle East. Well, and in the Middle East, uh, you know, we have faced in these last uh, two years uh, this um, uh, paradoxical dilemma of freedom and freedom movements, or generally freedom movements, uh, which initially seemed to be something uh, that, that America would stand for, or, or at least in the, in the abstract sense, uh, but then these freedom movements proving to be extraordinarily problematic uh, in various other ways and difficult to predict, difficult to, to manage, certainly from the outside, or, or not our role to manage even, I guess. But what's your advice more specific? St stay on the Middle East for a few minutes in terms of how to sort this balance between allowing the self-determination of peoples in a formerly repressive state, but then uh, hopefully keeping it within the boundaries. I worked for a president who read a lot and assigned us books. And one that he said I had to read was a book called The Peace to End All Peace by David Fromkin, which was about how the modern Middle East was created. <clears throat> the short version is it was created as a result of the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other. Uh, but a lot of the things, the countries that we're dealing with now, were created in the 1920s. Um, and one talks about the lines in 1923 and Lebanon and Syria and various, and a lot of them are artificial countries. Um, and many of them were under colonial rule in a variety of ways. A very long story, actually. And I think um, I obviously believe in historical lessons, and so I think one has to take in what the history of it is. Also, many of these countries um, were run by um, authoritarian figures. And as a result of some of the economic changes in places and also information technology, all of a sudden people knew about what they were missing in many different ways. And so what was going on in the Middle East has to do with a seeking for dignity and um, self-determination, but economic dignity. Um, I was in a very interesting discussion with an Arab um, at Georgetown in a public forum, and it was last winter. And I said, well, we can't talk about the Arab Spring anymore because it's the winter, so we should call it the Arab Awakening. And he got furious, and he said, that is such an outrageous statement. The Arabs haven't been asleep all this time. And I said, so what would you call it? And he said, I'd call it Arab troubles. And I said, well, what about Arab opportunities? So just in those four thoughts, you kind of see the different uh, ways that people look at it. So I do think that this is going to be a long process, certainly sitting in this replica of a uh, legislative body. We, everybody always says how long it took the United States to get our act together. And so the bottom line is this is going to take a while. Um, I also think that it's passing strange when people are critical of Muslims being elected to office. In Muslim-majority countries, it's likely that Muslims will be elected to office. Um, and so the important part is to figure out how there's a subsequent election and how you move from here to there. I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, which is an organization that was established by Ronald Reagan. Uh, in the 80s under the auspices of the Endowment for Democracy. And so one of the things we've talked about is how democracy works and how you move in, this is in uh, stenographic form, from Tari or Square to governance. What are the channels? And so I happen to believe in political parties and 
how they communicate. So that is what needs to happen, is a learning process on that. And then one of the endless discussions among political scientists is uh, what comes first, political development or economic development. They clearly go together because democracy has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. And so uh, we are trying, I think, to figure out how to help in this, but it's going to take a while. And the important part is not just to focus on elections, but also to focus on governance. And if I might parenthetically say, that would help in the United States also. <laughs> well, talk about that for a few minutes uh, in terms of the, the challenges that we have internally in terms of uh, any administration uh, presenting a coherent uh, foreign strategy and in relations with other countries in the current political environment. Well, I. Uh, in my career, I spent time on the Hill. I worked for Senator Edmund Muskie. If I look at some of the gray hair, some of you may have <laughs> remember him. Um, I, I was his chief legislative assistant, and then I went to the Carter administration to work in the National Security Council on uh, congressional relations. And I consider it kind of the most interesting part of our government, of how the executive and legislative branches work together. Uh, not helped a lot by the Constitution, which uh, divides the power. Um, but it is an interesting interchange, and I think when it's done right, is really important in terms of getting the support of the people for what um, an administration wants to do. And having been on both sides of this, is to make sure that it, and the executive branch explains what it is trying to do. That is what it is about. And it also, I think, makes you rethink the things you want, tries to make them explicable, tries to get the support. Um, but you operate on the basis that you might actually come to some agreement. And in my case, um, <coughs> people will be surprised about this, but um, I had all my partisan instincts surgically removed when I became Secretary of State. <laughs> Some of them have grown back. Painful. No, they've yeah. grown back. Uh, but basically, what is interesting, I had to figure out how we would get things done. And who was going to do this with me but Jesse Helms. And if you could think of somebody that I might disagree with more, uh, I, I have to tell the story if I might. When I was at the UN, he invited me to come and speak at a women's college in Raleigh. And I thought I could get out of it by saying, well, I'm happy to do it if you go with me. So he calls back in half an hour and says, I've changed my schedule. I will go with you. Um, so it is unlikely when you're invited to speak somewhere that somebody will introduce you as saying, this woman has idiotic ideas. Why would she come here? So I mean, he gave a very nice introduction. Um, and we then had a very good discussion. And then he liked it so much that he decided to invite me to his alma mater, Winga College. So we started driving. Um, around North Carolina looking for barbecue places and things. And uh, when he was semi-bionic by then in terms of artificial hips, and I was helping him out of the car. He could barely move, and I'm holding on to him. And the press all of a sudden takes a photograph of me hanging on to Jesse Helms <laughs> and saying, what an odd couple. So uh, <laughs> then when I was named Secretary of State, I went to see him, and he said, Ms. Madeline, we are going to make history together. And we really did cooperate on many, many things, the expansion of NATO and a number of different things. And I do think I had to explain a lot by dealing with him and others, but I think that is the process when it works. At the moment, I don't have a feeling that there's a lot of listening by some. Um, and, and I think that something has to happen if we're going to be able to deal with what are really, really serious issues out there. Well, I'm counting on uh, others here are going to pepper you with questions about uh, very current affairs and uh, your thoughts on those. Um, and so uh, let's pause on that for a moment and go back to the book. Uh, I want to talk to you more about the book and about the writing of it. Uh, uh, it's not the book that you exactly expect from a former Secretary of State because of the deeply personal aspects of it. Uh, and for those who haven't read it, the, uh, the fundamental uh, cornerstone of the personal story begins, though you've written about it previously, uh, but begins with your discovery uh, as an adult and 
after you'd achieved great prominence of your own Jewish ancestry. Uh, and here you are, the, the parents of uh, well-educated and prominent in their own world uh, uh, figures from Czechoslovakia. You, uh, family migrates to the United States. Uh, your father's given uh, diplomatic protection, in essence, uh, in the United States. Uh, but by then, you have been, uh, as a very young girl, you've been baptized as a Catholic. You grow up uh, completely unbeknownst, I take it, uh, of a Jewish heritage and uh, the deaths of many, many family members in the Holocaust. Uh, First, how could that be? How could it come to pass uh, that you would have been unaware of those things and that your parents would never have shared any of that with you at, at any stage? Well, let me give you the history. As I say, I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. So, uh, <laughs> but um, the, the bottom line is this, is that um, how, how the whole story uh, evolved. I um, was at the UN and got to be a fairly well-known public figure, which means, I think the governors will understand this, is getting letters from people that want things. And so among them, I would get letters from people who'd say, I'm your relative, send money, or I need a visa, or, um, or there would be letters that had various things in them that would say, I went to high school with your father in 1915, which would have been impossible since he was born in 1909, or the, the dates were wrong, the names of the villages were wrong. But in kind of like November 96, just as I was being vetted to be Secretary of State, I got a letter that had all the names right and the villages and the dates right, saying, my family knew your family to be a fine Jewish family. So I was in with the White House lawyers, and they were asking me the normal questions, like, had I paid my taxes? Did I have a nanny? Those kind of things. <laughs> so then towards the end of it, they said, we ask this question of everybody. Is there anything that we have asked, haven't asked you that we should ask you that you might want to tell us? And I said, well, it's perfectly possible that I'm of Jewish background. And they said, so what? The president is not anti-Semitic. So then over the holidays, I discussed it with my three daughters and son-in-laws. And they loved my parents. And they always thought that we had a fairly complicated story. And they wanted to know more. And they were fascinated by it. So then what happens is you are not allowed to talk to the press between the time that you are named uh, and you're confirmed. But there's a reporter, Michael Dobbs from the Washington Post, who wanted to do a profile of me. So my office gave him names of people to talk to. And the first week that I was Secretary of State, he comes into my office and starts presenting me with these disgusting documents, which were the Nazi records of uh, when people were sent to concentration camps. And they said, and he said, this was your cousin, this was, and I'm, you know, just absolutely stunned and appalled. Um, it's one thing to find out you're Jewish, and it's another to find out that many members of your family were sent to concentration camps. I, this may sound weird at this point, but I was trying to prove that a woman could be Secretary of State. And so I couldn't take off and do anything about this, but I asked my brother and sister to go to the Czech Republic and begin to try to find out the story. And they worked with a man who's now become a very good friend, Thomas Krauss, who was head of the Jewish community in Prague. And they began to piece the story together. And the only way I can describe how I felt at the time was, my parents, by the way, were dead um, long um, during this. And um, I felt as if I had been the first woman ever asked to represent my country in a marathon, and that just as I was starting to run, somebody gave me a heavy package and said, unwrap it while you run. Mm -hmm. So that was what I was trying to figure out, how to deal with that. And so ultimately, I felt that more needed to be done with the story. Part, the hardest part about this is one of the things you just asked, which is people were very critical of my parents and very critical of me and thought, how could this person be so stupid as not to ask? There is no particular way to explain this, except that I had no missing pieces in my story. Why would you ask something that, you know, uh, my parents talked a lot about their lives in Czechoslovakia. They talked about Christmas and how they got ready for Easter. Um, and there were no, you, why would you ask anything? Uh, that was the main thing. Why didn't they tell me? I don't know the answer to this. I really don't. I can only speculate. 
What happened was, according to records that uh, came out, is I, we were all baptized in 1941 in England after we were out. So they clearly didn't have me baptized to escape the Holocaust. We were already out. Um, and so I presume that they felt that it would be better for their children, child at the time, to be Christian. It didn't seem that is not a very hard conclusion to reach. Why didn't they tell us when we came to the United States? And I think that was, this is the other part. We came to the United States in 1949, 50, getting our uh, citizenship during the McCarthy era. Uh, my father had, for a short period of time, worked for a communist government. He didn't report to his, the communist government, but that was already an issue. And then I think the main thing uh, from knowing my parents is that they figured why did they have to load their children down with the great pain that they had felt through this. But I can't, you know, I can only speculate on it. I can only know what my parents were like, that protectiveness was their main thing. Everybody had died, um, and I think they were trying to make a new life. That is the, the only explanation I can make. I wish I had asked questions. I felt pretty stupid, but I wouldn't even know to this day how at that time I would have asked questions there was no reason to ask. I certainly would like to ask them now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but what made me really angry were people who were critical of my parents uh, that had no understanding of what it is that they had done. And all I can say is my parents gave me life twice, because otherwise, one of the things I did when I went back the first summer that I was Secretary of State, I went to the Pinka Synagogue which is a place where all the names of Jews that have been killed, Czech Jews, uh, were there. And I, my grandparents' names are there and some other relatives. And I thought, if my parents hadn't gotten me out of there, my name would be on that wall and my brother and sister would not exist. There's a, a, a story, that a family story, that threads through the entire book. Um, uh, of uh, your cousin, Malina Demlova, uh, and her sister, who becomes essentially your older sister, Dasha, in your childhood. Um, and the, the story there is that um, these two cousins of yours, there's the opportunity of their parents to send them both to live with your family in England before the war begins, but as the situation is deteriorating, or I guess until the larger war has begun. Um, and, but at the very last minute, uh, Melina and Dasha's parents decide that, uh, that Melina will stay, the younger daughter will stay. Um, and then, uh, and so Dasha comes to you and she survives, and Melina dies in Auschwitz um, several years later as a very young girl. Uh, I was really, uh, 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 moved by the story, even though you you come back to it periodically uh, through the book, and 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 the account is still incomplete. You know, you're unable to tell the entirety of what happened to her. But uh, I'm curious about. You were a very young girl uh, when those events occurred, uh, but until you began this rediscovery, um, how much, how aware were you of uh, of this girl who you uh, who you would have known only as a very young uh, young child? Uh, but were, was she someone you were aware of and that you thought about, or had she receded from memory? And this process was a uh, did you rediscover her in the process of seeking out um, your family? Well, first of all, one of the aspects of the story you tell. Um, is the difficulty of decisions. So, and, and it's hard to tell this chronologically, but it's worth saying this, is my, I, Dasha and I uh, spent a lot of time in the last couple of, she died last summer, but before that, spending time going over all this. And she had been one of the people, not on the kinder transport, but on this Wilton train, where there was this British person that did in fact create a train for um, children to leave um, um, to various places in, um, that were being occupied by the Germans. And so what happened was that um, Dasha was a little bit older than I and Milena was younger. And so the parents initially decide that both the girls are going to come to London. And at the last minute, the parents decide that Milena is too young to go. Uh, and so they keep her back. And Dasha later said she would never, even though you know she was older and her parents were dead, she would never forgive them for that decision. And yet they made the decision because they thought they were trying to protect her. And instead, it led to her death. Um, you have to rem put me into the right age group. I was two when the war began. Um, and I 
didn't know how many, I mean, this is a dreadful thing to say, especially since now I'm a grandmother myself. I have no sense of my grandparents at all beyond, and Dasha and I recently were talking about this, and she said, well, as grandfather said, or grandmother said, I never called anybody that, ever. I never said Babichka Dierechku to anybody. And, and so they were just people in photographs. And so Dasha was somebody that lived with us during the war, so I certainly knew her. She did not, people didn't talk about Milena at the time. And I did not really know what Milena looked like or anything. And among the various things that Michael Dobbs comes in with was a picture, and it, there was one older girl and a younger girl and a girl in a baby carriage. And he said, who's this? And I said, this is Dasha, this is me, this is my little sister. She said, no, this is Dasha, this is Milena, the little girl, and you're the one in the baby carriage. So. You know, I, I mean, these were very difficult. I mean, I didn't realize it. Milena, however, um, becomes a, a person um, after the, more in my case, I discovered her more later, but I read about her a lot. And she's a very interesting person, even if she weren't a relative, is that she was at, in Terezin, which was a, the, epitome of lunacy because it was established as a spa for Jews and a lot of people went there voluntarily which is really hard to believe because they were told that it was better than being in a ghetto in Prague and it was a place that had schools and enough um, uh, people that played various instruments to have a full symphony orchestra all kinds of things and at the same time it was not a terminal camp. It was a transition camp. And Milena was there, and there are drawings that she did um, all through that that are now in the Jewish Museum in Prague. And so she was this child that somehow existed through this. In the end, she died. Um, and so she's more, aside from being a cousin, but in the story, she is the symbol of a decision this is what I say about the difficulty of moral decisions. She was the symbol of a decision that was made for one reason that turned out uh, terribly. And Dasha would, as I said, she talked about her a lot and never said she could never forgive her parents, despite the fact that I think they thought they were doing the right thing. And not to, uh, not to stay on uh, the, the, the sort of terrible story of uh, what happened to Milena, but the, uh, when you began research for the book, uh, at one point, uh, you're going through uh, photographs that were taken by uh, a Red Cross inspector who visited Theresienstadt or Theresien, uh this show camp that the Nazis had, uh, put, had created to create a false illusion of, of the uh, concentration camps. And as you're going through these photographs, unexpectedly, you find a photograph. Uh, tell us about the, the picture that you discovered. Well, I it was Dasha had some pictures of Milena, what she looked like in a particular dress. And this, these photographs were taken, and all of a sudden there's this little girl that looks the same that has on the same dress. So she, is, she was very much there um, in that, and so she is kind of a, a theme through it. And, this, and I have to say, in terms of lessons learned, what happened was that the Red Cross was trying to prove or the Germans were trying to prove to the Red Cross that this was a nice place. So what they did was construct a whole artificial place. And the, what, and I describe this at some length in terms of the, the group that went in there to inspect. And part of what happened was that the people that were supposed to go were not the original group that were well trained. These people went there and kind of whitewashed the whole operation. Um, and there were pictures of, of children playing and eating and various things. Um, and it's a lesson today when we have these various inspection teams that go out, human rights teams, to see what is going on or what is happening in Iran with the nuclear things, is that people that go that are selected to do this have to be prepared to know what to look for, uh, that the world counts on them to tell the truth. And the Terezin trip was one of the you know, most cynical aspects of, of how public uh, uh, propaganda can, in fact, uh, taint everything when somebody is not prepared to do the job that, and they got fooled by the fact that there actually were sinks and toilets and beds and children walking around when the whole thing was an act. 
Uh, throughout the book, you talk about these choices, uh, a, a huge range of uh, the incredibly impossible or difficult choices faced by uh, major state figures like Eisenhower, whether to rescue the, uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, uprising in Prague uh, near the very end of the war, uh, whether America or the Brits or the French should have been involved uh, in Czechoslovakia before the war, um, big state decisions down to these very intimate human decisions like the ones uh, that affected the life of Molina. Uh, you also talk about uh, the struggle to attribute responsibility for these things, and as Stasha uh, uh, ends up blaming her parents for this terrible thing. But you make the point uh, that the responsibility for decisions like those lies not with those who make the decision, but with those who created the context that forced the decision to be made. Um, you then later in your career become very, uh, uh, very focused on the importance of individual responsibility versus collective responsibility in terms of sorting out the aftermath of genocide and terrible events. But, but talk for a moment about how this history from Europe and this history from your family uh, influenced the way that you approached the, the, the sorting out of responsibility for nations. Well, one of the choice stories that I think is worth repeating because um, it's the context. What happened was Czechoslovakia was divided. Slovakia became an independent country that was run by a pro-Nazi person. And Czechoslovakia, the Bohemian part, uh, in fact, then was run by a Reichsprotector, uh, Heydrich, who was the number three Nazi in the pantheon of horrible people. And what happened was the Czechoslovaks were in England trying to get um, to be recognized as a government in exile, which was difficult because in order to do that, the Brits would have to renounce Munich, which they didn't want to do. But the, the Czechs and President Benesch, who had been the president, was there with the government. My father was with the government in exile there. And so they were trying to, one, take care of uh, getting rid of Heydrich, but also to prove themselves to the British as being useful. So they planned the assassination of this number three person who had, uh, who had invented the Holocaust. And the Czechs trained with the British. Um, and what happened is they get, get in there, they parachute in, they stay with this lady. They then, it's a long, it's, it's actually an interesting story. They then assassinate Heydrich. And as a result of it, Heydrich decides to uh, round up more Jews and as it turns out, I find out that's when they rounded up my grandmother. But they also destroyed an entire town, Lidice. They leveled it completely. And so historically, the question is, was it worth assassinating this man and losing thousands of people in this town? It's a close call. I mean, this was a number three Nazi. As a result of it, the British recognized the value and recognized the government. So there were an endless number of trade-offs, but a very, very difficult aspect of it. And ultimately, I think you write that you thought as difficult to this, as it was, it was the correct decision. It's probably the correct. I mean, this this was a you know it was a uh, the number three Nazi and the only assassination of a Nazi all uh, during the war. But it's a it's very hard. So the issue, I mean, I've often thought about how much, obviously, my background affected um, what I did. Um, and some people say, was it when you found out you were Jewish? Well, I actually, the Bosnia thing was all before I knew that I was Jewish. What I did know was what had happened during World War II and what the responsibilities of decision makers is in terms of trying to make a difference. So. One of the things that I grew up with, I'm sure many people here, were the Nuremberg trials, which was punishing those who had uh, done the whole Nazi uh, propaganda disaster inventing all this. So the interesting part was we get to Bosnia issue. David Sheffer, who you're going to have, was on my staff. And one of the first votes that I took as UN ambassador was the creation of the War Crimes Tribunal. It was the first time that that kind of thing had happened since Nuremberg. And in fact, the purpose of it was that um, you can't blame a whole nation. I think one of the things that I learned 
as a grown-up and also as a public official was not all Germans were responsible for what Hitler did. Uh, somebody asked me, how can I be friends with Germans? The bottom line is one of my best friends is Joschka Fischer, who was the foreign minister of Germany, who was completely against what the Nazis, you know, he grew up in uh, counter-authority as a result of that. So you can't blame a whole country. You can't blame all the people. So here the issue was you can't blame all Serbs for the fact that Milosevic and Mladic and Karadzic were the ones that did these things. So the war crime tribunal is very important because it assigns, in, removes collective guilt and assigns individual guilt. And of the various votes I took, that is one I'm proudest of. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in The Hague looking at how the war crimes tribunals work. Um, not only that one, but the one for Rwanda, and then watching how they have been the basis of the International Criminal Court. It would be interesting for you to have David here, because David clearly was the brains behind this operation, and then he also was our negotiator on the International Criminal Court, and how disappointed he was when the United States did not join it. So. Um, it's an interesting aspect in terms of a tool that can be used um, on trying to assign individual guilt. And also interesting that in the book you write about that your mother felt very differently about, uh, about the, uh, how to uh, view Germans after the war. Yeah, no, and she obviously had suffered the worst um, in all of this. And she did say that she was very glad my name was going to be Albright and not Albrecht. And so she really was uh, continually under, yeah. yeah. Let's take some questions. I've been fascinated by all the serious topics that you always address, but I have a lighthearted question for you because I also have been fascinated by the layers of messages that you have communicated through your pins. And I would like you to uh, tell us one of the most profound communications that you, statements that you made through one of the pins that you wore in a, in a diplomatic um, conversation. So for people that don't know, I do have this pin collection and um, I um, say that none of it would have happened if it hadn't been for Saddam Hussein. Uh, because the background of the story, I clearly like jewelry, but uh, the background of the story is that when I got to the UN in February 93, it was the end of the Gulf War. And the ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. And my instructions as the ambassador was to make sure the sanctions stayed on. And there were six of the sanctions resolutions, so it was something we talked about all the time. And my instructions kept saying, you've got to do everything. And I said perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly, which he deserved. He had invaded Kuwait. So after a while, a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them, an unparalleled serpent. And so I happened to have a snake pin. So I wore it when um, we were doing Iraq. So you've seen how after a meeting, the ambassadors go out and talk to the press. So all of a sudden, the camera zeroes in and says, and the reporter says, so why are you wearing the snake pin? I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. Um, so I went out, and I bought a bunch of costume jewelry uh, to uh, indicate what we were going to do on any given day. So on, on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, a lot of horrible insects and carnivorous animals. And it was right after the first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I said, people said, what are we going to do today? And I said, read my pins. And so that has been. Um, well, and there's a show that goes with it. but. I think the most outrageous thing I did, and the pins really got me into trouble, which was that there is a picture in the book, but on the 50th anniversary of NATO, uh, it just so happened that Secretary of Defense Cohen and President Clinton and I were sitting on a sofa together. And I don't know who did this first, but one person went like that, you know. So all of a sudden, we're there as the monkeys. And the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil monkeys. So I happened to find three monkeys for a pin. And I was so furious and upset about what the Russians were doing in Chechnya. I thought it was evil that uh, we had our summit with the Russians in the summer of 2000, and I decided to wear the monkeys. And so we're walking into the summit, and 
President Putin turns to President Clinton and says, we always notice the pins Secretary Albright wears. Why are you wearing those monkeys? And I said, because of your Chechnya policy. And he got so mad at me. And President Clinton looked at me like, are you out of your mind? You are the, the chief diplomat. You've just screwed up uh, all these, you know, so. It may be a little early in this discussion, but I can tell you when pins got me out of trouble, which is that, um, and you all, this is serious, but I, I do have to tell this story. Is, <laughs> Please do. Um, I invented the art of diplomatic kissing. You can't visualize Kissinger or Baker going somewhere and having a big embrace. So uh, what happened was that it's more confusing than meets the eye, because the Latin, some kiss on the right cheek and some on the left cheek, so on a lot of uh, bump noses. And then the French kiss twice, and the Dutch three times. And then there was Yasser Arafat, just the thought, right? <laughs> so, uh, they, um, so he was an indomitable kisser on the forehead, on the cheeks. And at least he and I were the same size, but visualize this with President Clinton, right? <laughs> So I arrive in South Korea, and big embrace, good meetings, et cetera. I come back, and all of a sudden, I get a call from a journalist saying, you do think that the South Korean foreign minister, we can't tape this, uh, uh, the South Korean foreign minister should be fired for what he said. I said, well, what did he say? He said, well, you know, we were all having dinner, and he said, I love it when Secretary Albright comes, because we're about the same age, and I'm this tired old man, and she's full of vim and vigor, and when I embrace her, she has very firm breasts. <laughs> so what do you have to say to that? And I said, well, I have to have something to put those pins on. <laughs> From foreign affairs to architecture. <laughs> um, um. Cool. Madam Secretary, it's Fred Hitz, and I'm hey, so are nice you? to see you. And, well, we and, did stuff together. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. That's the spy I'm, I'm, part. I, I, I <laughs> love to hear your advice to the current administration and to Senator Kerry, your successor, of how to get off this horrible confrontation. Uh, between the parties on Capitol Hill where nothing's getting done. Is there any secret that hasn't been uh, uh, tried or revealed? It just seems to me that even after an election, which the president won substantially in the popular vote, we're back to the same old slugging it out and not talking with one another. Now, so this is a man who did congressional relations. So, uh, <laughs> But I don't know the answer because I think partially there is a some reason, some those who are being obstructionist are getting something out of it. Um, and therefore, I think an awful lot depends on all of us who are the voters and the public that we don't want to put up with this anymore. Um, I have to say that the um, confirmation hearing of Senator Hagel was one of the most disturbing things that I've seen in a very long time. Um, and having been confirmed Firmed a couple of times. I know what it's like to, to be there. It's, it's not an easy um, set of hearings. I, I have to say what happened to me when I was UN ambassador um, being confirmed for that, what happened was there was a vote. And they all left me where with Senator Luger, who was very friendly, but also very smart. And he asked me so many questions about everything. And I thought, this is like my PhD orals exam. Uh, and so you have to be prepared for it. And But it's different than being uh, hectored and yelled at and, and disrespected. And so partially, I think there's some kind of um, benefit that those people that did that must feel. So some of it has to do with what is going on in, in terms of our political system at this moment and uh, the splits that are happening. And um, I, I wish there were some other way. Because I think that the people in an administration, I think, want des any administration, want desperately to be able to get things done. Um, and so I'm surprised that the others don't. But I don't know what the answer is. I think the only answer that I can think of is all of us who simply will say, we are not going to listen to this anymore. We're not going to put up with it. I also, it doesn't take me very long to get around to blaming the media. 
Uh, but I do think there's also um, a payoff for various channels that just kind of uh, get a, uh, more ratings or something out of um, uh, what, um, what they're saying and that they are pointing up the fight. I, I said something on purpose a little while ago. I do think elections are essential, uh, but they are not the only thing in our system. And the fact that well, President Obama said this the other day with, when he was having the interview with Secretary Clinton. He'd only been in the second term four days, and people are already talking about um, 2016. I mean, it's ridiculous. We've just finished a set of elections, and all that happens is the money that's involved in it, and we should be talking about governance. It isn't just governance in Egypt. We should be talking about governance here, and that we as voters didn't vote these people in in order. Why do people vote for people who don't believe in government? I have no idea. Um, I mean, and I mean, if, if you don't believe in government, why do you want to be in it? And you know what I really missed in this campaign? I wish that we had had an intelligent discussion about what the role of government in the 21st century is. It's obviously different, given all the information and the way that we operate. Maybe the Miller Center can do so. I mean, we need to know what it is we think the government should be doing. Uh, what, what does a government do? What are our responsibility towards the government and the government towards us? So, other than that, I have no views. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned the war in Syria and how it's affecting the entire Middle East. What do you think are the most important issues to consider when deciding upon involvement? In the Middle East? In Syria. I have to say the following thing, which is that um, I have spent a lot of time in studying the use of force, generally. Uh, whether, and certainly, in fact, of the kinds of things that we did in Kosovo, which is the limited use of force. I have also spent a lot of time looking at peacekeeping operations, and I have spent a lot of time on human rights issues and on studying what um, we can't allow to go on. And one of the new things that I've been working on now uh, is kind of the evolution of all of this. Uh, and my co-chair with all of this is um, Rich Williamson, who was um, a, an ambassador for President Bush uh, and Governor Romney's chief foreign policy advisor. So we are working on this together, uh, the auspices of the United States Institute of Peace and the Holocaust Museum, on the issue of responsibility to protect, which is a new concept that if something horrible is going on somewhere and the leader of the country is not only do, not doing what a leader is supposed to do is protect his people, uh, then uh, is it the responsibility of the international community to do something about it? That is the question. The problem with it is, is trying to figure out, first of all, issues of national sovereignty. Do people have a right to do something in somebody else's country? And second, who is going to carry out the responsibility to protect? Um, and you know, what is the instrument? Is it US forces? Is it NATO? Is it the Arab League? Who is actually the enforcer of it? And the, what we did, what happened in Libya, there was a UN resolution that actually had responsibility to protect in it. Um, and so the NATO forces that went in did it under those auspices. It was viewed as something where a difference could be made by using military force. Now, I believe in something that I made up, which is called the doability doctrine. Can you actually get anything done? Will it make a difference? And I think that's where we are on Syria, trying to figure out what, in fact, whether there is any responsibility to protect, but who would do it, uh, and would it make a difference, and would it save a lot of people? And I think that's the discussion that's going on. So the United States at this point is actually doing quite a lot in terms of non-lethal assistance, uh, humanitarian assistance in a variety of different ways. Uh, and, and there are discussions going on about whether there is this doctrine actually works internationally. It is under the auspices of the UN. And we are watching the Russians and the Chinese having, we've kind of driven into a cul-de-sac as to whether uh, there can be a UN 
um, they, they abstained on the Libya vote. They are making very clear they would veto uh, a vote on Syria. So I think it's up there trying to figure it out, frankly. You know, we, there was a no-fly zone in Libya because the Libyan military wasn't very strong. The military in Syria is very strong. Um, so I think that what is going on, and I have a sense that Secretary Kerry is going to spend time looking at what is doable, where we can make a difference. But it clearly, clearly is on people's consciences. 60,000 people have died. But today there are stories more and more about the fact that whatever happens, Syria is going to be a failed state or Somalia or something like that. And, what, and people have to look at one of the things that I talk about a lot are the unintended consequences of foreign policy decisions. So what, is, what are the unintended consequences as far as Jordan is concerned? As I said earlier, Jordan, Turkey, um, Lebanon, et cetera. So these are very hard decisions to make. And I have to tell you, I have great respect for people that are sitting in their offices trying to make these decisions. Nobody, even people I disagree with, uh, don't, nobody sits in their offices trying to make stupid decisions. So I think that what they try to do is to get the information and the context that we were talking about. Madam Secretary, it's a pleasure to see you this evening in purpose, person as I have worked for you. Yeah. Um, Mary J. Abbott, the name, I began working in 1998 um, for USAID in Baghdad, 06 and 07 at a PRT, and in Afghanistan, 2009 through 2012 at a PRT. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Thank you so much. Um, Washington Post had an article today about the difficulty in the peace process involving um, President Karzai, the Taliban, our government, and the other and the other governments involved in trying NATO, um, the coalition trying to bring um, uh, peace to, to, by, by late 2014. Could you please comment upon that? Thank you. I think that um, Afghanistan, for me, is one of the best examples of the unintended consequences of foreign policy decisions. Um, and um, just to go back on something, I was in the Carter administration when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Um, and the idea was that we could never get them totally out, but we could punish the Soviets. And so there were any number of steps that were taken uh, to do that. And then uh, when the Soviets, and among the various things that happened was the United States providing Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, believing. Um, and, I, and I have to say, one of the things, Spignev Brzezinski, my boss, went to the Khyber Pass. I think some of you may remember the picture of him with an automatic weapon. And he looked out of the Mujahideen and he said, God is on your side. Now, I don't know where Osama bin Laden was at that time, but basically this all of a sudden became uh, a religious issue as to who was doing the right thing. The Reagan administration provided Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen. There was chaos after the Soviets left. The Pakistanis began the development of the Taliban in order to get law and order into Pakistan, uh, into Afghanistan. So this, uh, we all know the story, but it is a story that started a long time ago. Uh, I think that the issue here, and this is a very hard part, you and I talked about this earlier, is that uh, President Obama has made very clear that our troops are coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, what we need to talk about now, and you were doing a PRT kind of, is what is the civilian component that is left there? And what are our, not our, just our responsibilities, but the international responsibilities to try, I, I know that nation building is a four letter word, but the bottom line is, what is the infrastructure that needs to be provided? Um, and I think that we would not honor those who gave their lives for this if we do not realize that the job is not over and that there needs to be a civilian component that goes on, not that the United States pays for by ourselves, but that recognizes the fact that this is a, a chaos, continues to be a difficult place, and that there needs to be um, something done uh, about this. And can I say something about that you, on your behalf and others like you, there is nothing 
fancy about being in the Foreign Service or being a diplomat. It is hard work and it is more and more dangerous. And there are more names of diplomats who have died that are on the wall at the State Department. And I think people need to understand what a dangerous job it is and that protecting diplomats is really important. On the other hand, diplomats cannot just exist behind walls. The job of a diplomat is to actually be the eyes and ears of the President of the United States or whatever leader in a particular country. So we have a lot of very complicated questions to ask ourselves at this point of how do we operate, how many responsibilities do we have on civilian reconstruction or helping governments get on their feet. And what do those last comments uh, say to us about Benghazi and the questions that have been raised about Benghazi? Well, I think that um, I don't know all the questions on Benghazi, but I know the following thing, for instance, that <coughs> Um, I loved being Secretary of State, everybody knows that, except on August 7th, 1998, when our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were blown up, uh, and trying to figure out what happened, and where should embassies be located, and uh, what is the protection, and how do you hear about problems. One of the things that the review board that reviewed what we did said that there needed to be, at the top of the State Department, a way that somebody knew about all the threats that were coming in. But let me tell you something. Every morning after August 7th, I got a briefing from diplomatic security about things that were happening somewhere. And they would come in and they would say, there's an unidentified Vespa that was just near our embassy in Athens. Or somebody dropped some information over the transom in Chile or wherever, what do you want to do about it? I was not qualified to make that decision. And I, and I think that the question is, how do you decide to close embassies and therefore do nothing, uh, or have embassies that are forts and aren't able to do the job? And so, and that costs money. So for instance, my uh, review board was headed by Admiral Crow, and he, they recommended that $10 billion be spent on security. Now there are recommendations for spending on security. And let me just tell you the budget issues that are out there right now. The entire budget for the State Department, which is also USAID, and everything, not only paying for the diplomats, but also paying for the programs, is now requested somewhere around $45 billion. The budget for the Defense Department is somewhere between six and $700 billion. Um, and out of that $45 billion, we are supposed to spend money on more security. So when this happened to me, I went up and I testified and I said, you are always asking me to rob Peter to pay Paul for a particular program. Now you're asking me to rob Paul too. There is no money. And so if we are going to continue, we have to figure out how to, how to make the budget work so that we can have, we need diplomats. I have read some ridiculous columns recently which says, is diplomacy dead? I mean, the bottom line is we have to have diplomats who do their job and who uh, represent us and and find out what's going on in a country. They have to be protected. They have there has to be money for this, and it goes back to the question of how one gets our executive and legislative branch to understand this and not be in some stonewalling fights on it because we're not getting anywhere. And meanwhile, people are dying both in this country and abroad. Hello, Madam Secretary. Um, this question is a, this question is in light of the recent changes in Egypt. I wanted to know your thoughts on, um, in terms of these changes, how stable do you think the Arab Spring democracies actually are? And in light of that, how do you see the U.S. role in the Middle East evolving in the next few years? Well, I, I think we don't know how stable they are. I think that uh, in many ways, I think that the jury is out on it. And um, the things that are happening in Egypt um, I, th I thought a couple of days ago that, in fact, the military was somehow getting back into the act. I don't think we know exactly. Um, and President Morsi uh, is somebody that is, um, in many ways, I mean, he, he's elected, but by my, if you're not in um, plurality terms, uh, or not in majority terms. He was elected in plurality terms. And, and he has to deal with, I mean, politics there in terms of his international posture, which is why 
Um, he was actually good on an international statement and then bad on a domestic, because he also has a domestic base that he has to um, please in some ways. And so I think that um, it's unclear where this is going and whether the opposition parties will deal with him or uh, any of that. And then there are, there are real questions about what other groupings are there. One of the things that I think it's important for people to understand generally, this was true of Hamas, it's true of the Muslim Brotherhood, and to some extent people were asking why is there a Muslim party in Turkey, the AKP. These are parties they're not at all the same, and I don't want one compared to another, but they actually do constituency services. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood did constituency services. Hamas is a terrorist organization, but it did do constituency services. And so this is the part that I talked about democracy having delivery, ha has to deliver. And whatever political parties cannot be elitist parties, who uh, only worry about themselves and don't worry about their constituencies. And so a lot depends, and this is where the issue on Egypt gets so complicated, which is, as I said earlier, what happened there was people wanted jobs. They wanted dignity. They wanted to be able to make a living in some way. At the moment, there's such chaos in Egypt that it's hard to see you know, whether the IMF is really going to give the loan. Um, Egypt's really dependent on the tourist industry. There are not a lot of people that want to go be a tourist in Egypt at the moment. So I think that this is where you're, we have to get out of a vicious circle and get into some kind of a virtuous circle on it. But it's, it's iffy. It is iffy. But it goes back to an original question you asked. Why this happened is because these are people living in these countries who want a different life. They do not want to be run by dictators or authoritarian figures or the military. They want to be able to participate um, in their lives. And so a lot depends on how much they're able to do. But I think it's a very, it's fascinating process, but it is um, um, very uh, tenuous. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a master's student of public policy at the Batten School at UVA, um, and it's awesome to have you here. I had a question about something you mentioned earlier, an objective of fighting terrorism without creating more terrorists. And I was wondering what you thought the impact of the increasing use of drones would have on such a goal, especially given the lack of any well-articulated policy currently. Well, again, you know, I wish I had answers to everything. Um, but the bottom line is, I think that there has been a very effective way. First, you know, Osama bin Laden was not killed by a drone. But the bottom line is that there have been um, his death. It was a deeply significant act in terms of um, making clear that the center of Al Qaeda uh, has been uh, demolished. But the bottom line is, is that there are other parts, various either groups that uh, identify themselves with Al Qaeda or some other part of a terrorist organization. And we have figured out how to um, rid ourselves of some of the worst people. I think there's no question about that. There isn't, there, people, this has to do with the moral decision question we were talking about earlier. If you can manage to, without losing any Americans, because that, you know, uh, on the ground, manage to get rid of, with a drone, of somebody who we know is planning to kill a bunch of other people, that seems to make sense. At least it does to me. The question is how, when there are drones that then kill innocent people, is that worth it? And so it's one of these questions where you have to keep asking yourself, and this sounds really cold-blooded, but the cost-benefit aspect on it. I think the real problem at the moment is that we don't really know what the policy is. The problem is that is this a subject for public debate, or is it the fact that some of it has to be kept secret? So I think it's a very, very hard issue. Same issues came up about the morality of using air power only in Kosovo. 
And there were people who said we should have troops on the ground so that they are also exposed. I didn't believe that. Why should we get people killed if we could do it uh, through air power? So I find it a very, very hard question. And I think it's going to be something that is very much um, out there being discussed, but also for another reason. Other countries have drones. And we are good guys, but supposing other countries begin to use drones in places that we don't want them. And so this is one of the big issues out there in terms of how we deal with it. Now, I, I, I said this to some of you earlier. I'm sure you've all watched Homeland. So the question is whether killing by drones of innocence then creates a whole other uh, set of problems. But we, it is very difficult to get rid of terrorists. There's no question. They are, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how much reading, I mean, we've all done a lot of reading on this, and part of it has to do with what is the context in which they're operating. Uh, are the people that help them in various places um, believers, or are they people that are blackmailed into helping them because they're also afraid? And so the thing that has to happen, which takes a long time, and Americans, I think Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. <laughs> and so one of the things we need to do is to figure out what the root causes of terrorism are. Why is it that people think that they uh, are better off if they blow themselves up? And so this is a very long project in terms of trying to figure out what the root causes are. Secretary, I think we have time for one more question from the audience. But before we take that, I want to relay a question that comes in via Twitter from, uh, uh, from our audience watching the live stream. Uh, a quick one from Twitter. What advice do you have for Hillary now that she's left office? <laughs> well, she needs to get some sleep. Um, but I. I you know, she and I actually talk fairly frequently. And I think that she is one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. She's obviously a really good friend. I wouldn't have been Secretary of State if it weren't for her. And the reason I know that is that President Clinton said so publicly. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, and he, we were at an embassy abroad, and we used to do this thing about where I would introduce her, and she would introduce him. And so he said, well, that Hillary had said to him, why wouldn't you name Madeleine as Secretary of State? She is somebody who fully agrees with your views, expresses them better than anybody else. And besides, it would make your mother very happy. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I think she is remarkable. I think she has a great deal to offer in whatever she does. And um, that she has the capability of um, analyzing a problem, of presenting it really well, of being astute politically. And so my, my main, uh, she's tired, she is. And, um, and I think she needs to kind of, um, you know, figure out what she wants to do. And um, I think she's been a remarkable Secretary of State. So uh, I'm always happy to give her advice. But, but I, I do think she's done a remarkable job. Madam Secretary, uh, this has been a special evening. Thank you so much. Um, I want to return to uh, a piece in your book, Prague Winter, where it's after World War II, um, democracy has been reinstated, and then it falls to the communists. And uh, for the listeners here, your reflections on the dynamics that led to those circumstances and what happened and why you think that happened. That, I'm glad you asked that. It may take me a few minutes to explain it. I think that a lot of it um, goes back to a number, first of all, just to describe what, Munich, what happened in Munich. Uh, as a result of decisions made by the British and French with the Germans and Italians over the heads of the Czechoslovaks, Czechoslovakia was basically sold down the river. There's no question about that. There had been a treaty, a non-aggression treaty, that the Czechs had with the French. And the French were supposed to come in if there was an invasion. The Germans invade, and the French did not come in. The Russians, uh, the Soviet Union, had an agreement that said if the French came in, they would come in. They then obviously didn't come in, but they always had the excuse that they would have. And part of what happened was that even though the government in exile was in London, 
Um, and one of the other things, if I may just kind of jump ahead, I have been fascinated by what happens to the various transitional groups like the Libyans or the Syrians. I can see how difficult it is for a group of exiles to figure out who really represents them. So what happened was the, the Czech or Slovak government was in London, represented by the former president, but there was a group of Czechoslovaks that were in Moscow all through the war. Um, and also, there had definitely been kind of a residue among Czechoslo Czechoslovaks that the Russians might have defended them, whereas the West sold them down the river and did not defend them. And so ultimately what happens is that President Benesh goes to Moscow and meets with a lot of the Russian leaders. Um, and. Um, it's a complicated story in terms of the Soviets saying that they were their allies. Then this decision that was made uh, during the war that in fact the American forces would not liberate Czechoslovakia. General Patton got 45 miles in and he didn't go any further and so then the Soviets liberated Czechoslovakia. So you have the residue of all of that. Then the part that was interesting about interwar Czechoslovakia, it was the only country that was a democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. And it had a legal socialist party and a legal communist party. And it had no nobility. They'd all been thrown out the window in 1348. So uh, it was very much uh, a, a kind of uh, middle class country. And so there were those various elements. So the war ends. Um, and what happened is there was an election in 1946, which the communists won. They had a plurality in that. And then the party that allied with them were the Social Democrats. And so they had the majority in the government. Um, and there were going to be elections in 1948. And what Stalin wanted to do is he had accumulated his empire uh, mostly there had been coups and various things that happened or governments that weren't recognized. He thought that Czechoslovakia could be a model where the communists actually were elected, uh, fully elected, so they didn't have to have alliances with others. But as a result of some of the tactics of the communists between 46 and 48, it became evident they were going to lose the elections. And so they created... You're so, I'm sure you're so sorry you asked this. I wrote my <laughs> honors thesis about it. So uh, the bottom line is that the mood began to shift, and it looked like they weren't going to uh, survive. And so a lot of things happened. And all of a sudden, and this is one of the things that shows the fragility of democracy. There were a group of ministers who were neither communists nor social democrats who didn't like what was going on. And so they, they decided that they would force a constitutional crisis and resign. And they were counting on President Benesh to back them. But they hadn't informed him properly. And it got to be there ultimately was a communist coup. Um, and it's much more complicated than even say, I said it. But a lot of it is the background of it. Uh, and a lot of it is the fragility of democracy. And then also that nobody said anything from the West about this at the time. The only thing that did happen ultimately is the United States, I think, our behavior, you American behavior between 45 and 48 was somewhat naive uh, in terms of what the Soviet Union was doing um, and the salami tactics that they were using in establishing their satellites. And it wasn't after, until after the communist coup in February 48 that there was a decision to create NATO. And NATO was created in 49, kind of as a result of this, when people tried to figure it out. So, um, but it, it came about as a result of some of the history, some of the mood, some, some of it lack of action, um, and also the coalition of communists with social democrats. Um, and so it's a long story and a very sad one. And um, so um, I, I think there are many lessons in it, but partially about the fragility of democracy, which goes a little bit to your question. Um, and then in 1968, during the Prague Spring, when there was an attempt to reverse this, then it went the other way again. Um, and and, and let me just uh, maybe conclude on this. People were very, very excited about the end of the Cold War. 
and the restoration of democracy in all these countries. And there was the sense that it was going to be easy, that these were people just like us, and all the attitude surveys, um, in my case, us, um, that all the attitude surveys showed that these countries wanted to be part of Western Europe. They wanted to uh, be able to have the same freedoms. And there was euphoria, post-Cold War euphoria. In the Czechoslovak case, there was Václav Havel, who was one of the more remarkable leaders of our time. But it's much harder than it looks. And if one, again, there is the question about democracy delivering. And you look at what is happening in Hungary. Uh, I think there were some, um, you know, the, whatever the elections were that just happened in the Czech Republic. There are problems with the austerity programs. And so it is a lot harder. And I think that it goes to the whole point that even in this country, democracy is not an event. It is a process um, and a very difficult one. Um, and we underestimate the difficulty. And so then other people compared what happened in Central and Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War with what's happening in the Arab world. Very different. There is not a desire to be part of the West in what is happening in the Arab world. It is a different story. But the, the context and the, the difficulty of democracy is the same. So. Thank you.